So now you have to tell us how it all began. Uh, you mentioned the labor of love. So at what point did you first learn of this story? Uh, well, like probably 99.9% .9 of you all, I love Sunset Boulevard. And there was a book that came out a few years back called Close Up on Sunset Boulevard. It was a making of the movie. And there was one chapter in the book about this musical, and I had never heard about this. And um, one of the people that was interviewed for the book was Alan Eichler, who was in the audience here somewhere, who was friends with Dixon Hughes. And he was the producer of the Swans and on Sunset uh, show. And I took uh, Alan out to direct this, and he said, I've been waiting for 25 years for somebody to ask me about this. <laughs> and that sort of led one thing after another to uncovering other people who would, um, like Stephen Bach, the music publisher who had that interview with Richard Stapley, that was like a miracle that that existed. And then we found the interview with Dixon, and then it started to um, become apparent that we had the materials to tell the story. And of course, Gloria Swanson saved everything from her entire career uh, and everything relating to the musical, even though she never talked about it in any interview or wrote about it. It's all there at the Harry Ransom Center, including all the audio tapes. So that's where it all sort of began. So how long was the process from inception of the idea to tonight? Mm -hmm. uh, Eight years, I think, pretty much. From that first um, lunch with, uh, with Alan, that was around the I Am Divine time. Wow. And, uh, you know, things just unfold in the pace that they unfold, so. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, the interesting element, you know, in the early parts of the film, we see clearly um, Zoom calls, which is something that we're seeing newly in documentaries this year. So was, was the past year kind of a, a hindrance or a motivator in getting this finished? Well, uh, we were cutting all along, and then when COVID hit, there were just some, we had planned to go to the Harry Ransom Center and actually film there. So that whole uh, ending animation, um, was really because we couldn't go. So we just had to find ways to tell the story in different ways and doing interviews on Zoom that you're gonna be seeing a lot of that in documentaries that are coming out over the next festival, yes. few years. Um, but it, it seemed to work and the idea of uh, appearing in the film, that wasn't really part of the plan initially. Uh, I was working with a friend of mine, Elijah Trenner, who was sort of helping come up with new ideas and ways to structure the film, and he suggested actually, why don't you put yourself in the movie and show the process of what it's like to make a documentary and how you find these kinds of materials, and I thought that was pretty cool, because I like seeing that kind of stuff. And archives are, you know, of course, Outfest has the Legacy Program and an incredible archive of LGBT film. I mean, we, we need to treasure our archives because how many more stories are there sitting in boxes that haven't been told yet? I have this note card here and you're stealing all the things I was going to say about. <laughs> I was going to bring up the Legacy Archive. No, because I think it's, um, I mean, you've told um, a few stories about kind of queer history, especially in Hollywood, that, you know, doesn't get told for many decades. And I'm just, and I love that you kind of show the process of how that's uncovered. And I'm just wondering, like, are you looking for these stories more and more? Or are they finding you just by coincidence? It's just like a thunderbolt. It just happens, you know? Like, I happen to know Alan Eichler, and I happen to say, tell me a little bit about this. And then he just spilled the beans, and there was just so much to talk about. And, you know, Gloria, obviously, is somebody who's known around the world, but Richard and Dixon, are, nobody knows who these guys are. And when we started making the film and getting deeper into it, it became more and more about them. Like, the whole last two-thirds of the movie is really about them. And I had no expectation that that was going to be the case at, at the beginning, I, and especially Richard, as we got deeper into it and talking about his struggles to remain relevant, and much in the same way that Norma Desmond had her struggles and a little bit of delusion. Richard had the same thing. So the, the parallels to Sunset Boulevard were just so amazing that um, it just made sense to make it as a film. Yeah, and I'm interested. It's just it, the film's almost kind of three biographical tales in one. and. Um, Probably very different process in, in excavating the information. I mean, Gloria Swanson, as you said, there's so much historical record. And let's start with her because it's it, there has been a lot written, especially by Gloria herself. And I'm just like, how do you approach getting a fresh perspective on her life um, in making up this film? Yeah, you know, I read the book and I was like, well, when is she going to talk about this musical? It seemed like it occupied so much of her mind. But she was, as, as one of our subjects says in the film, she led many lives. She had so much going on, even during this period that we're talking about. She was running businesses and she was just this amazing, she, you know, she had a patent company and she was bringing German scientists out of Germany during the war. It's like, what didn't this woman do? It was so incredible. Um, but talking to her granddaughter, Brooke, uh, who unfortunately couldn't be with us uh, tonight, but she sends her love, um, she, Brooke gave us a personal point of view on, on her grandmother. And so, you know, we wanted to show a side of Gloria that people really didn't know. Because if they know her at all today, it's through the Norma Desmond character. And that is about as far as you can get from the real Gloria. 
And with Richard and Dixon, it's, um, you know, they came from an era where, you know, talking about two men in a relationship wasn't really publicly done. Um, and, and it seems like even in some of the interview footage, they're still reluctant to even speak on it. And I'm just wondering if the people that you met that knew them, like, shared that reluctance or if they were kind of at a point where they could talk. No, I mean, at this point, the, yeah. the cat's out of the bag. I mean, <laughs> everyone is comfortable talking about it. And also in a kind of a humorous way, about, particularly about Richard, that at a certain point, it's like, it, it's, there's really nothing to hide anymore. And Richard did become more comfortable in his older years. He ultimately allowed Dixon to proceed with Swanson on Sunset, which did talk about their relationship. And so he, you know, he wasn't marching in, you know, on Santa Monica Boulevard in the Pride Parade, I'm sure. But, you know, uh, Dixon, um, you know, had a very happy life in Palm Springs and, you know, was part of the gay scene both here in LA and in and Palm Springs. So, you know, they, they were just men of a different generation. I mean, when we, we did the Tab Hunter film a few years ago, it was a similar dynamic with Tab. Just, you could see him in that film just squirming sometimes, just not wanting to talk about it, but he understands that we're living in a different time, but that res reticence to talk about their lives, because they had, out of safety, you know, they just, they, they couldn't talk about their lives because they could lose everything. I want to give the audience a chance to ask some questions here, so please raise your hands if you have any. Yeah, right here. Well, the question was about Gloria's point of view on all this, and I don't think, I mean, we'll never know, because she didn't write about it, she didn't talk about it, so what we do have here is Richard, who is an actor, you know, and likes to see himself as the center of the story, right? So how much of Richard's story is embellished, exaggerated, or the truth, we'll never really know. But a great, for me, a great story is a great story. So for me, I didn't care if it was true or not. <laughs> you know, it, it, it is just like, I'm just attracted to his, the way he tells his story. So someone asked me outside, what would you like to ask Gloria if you could? And that's what I would, exactly what I would ask her. So what was really going on there? But she loved to be in love. And I, you know, Richard is a very, very handsome guy. And I'm sure, you know, under the moonlight in Palm Springs with a couple of cocktails, who knows? <laughs> Did you say you had a follow-up question to that? Or? Yeah, the uh, question is about the animation and if it was part of the original vision. Yes, we always plan to use animation, and we've just found the perfect uh, illustrator for that, and his name is Maurice Bellacoop, and he's somebody in the early 90s when I was coming out, he, and he's, he still is, a very active um, underground gay cartoonist and illustrator, and I loved his stuff, and it just hit me that he would be the perfect guy to draw this, and there's so many details. If you see it for a second time, you'll see like when Gloria emerges, uh, for the first time when she meets uh, Dixon and Richard, she's wearing the same dress that um, Rosalind Russell wore in Andy Mame. You know, so there's all kinds of little, and the gay bar, when Richard goes to the gay bar, that's all based on the gay bar in the movie Advise and Consent. You know, so he's, he's always throwing in little details there for, for uh, movie fans. He's incredible, and he's working on a graphic novel right now, autobiographical uh, graphic novel. Any more questions again, back there? Yeah, the question is about what was Richard doing around the time of Swanson on Sunset, and it's so bizarre to me because Alan says he didn't even think about Richard. Dixon didn't know where he says know where Dixon was, uh, where Richard was, but Richard was like living just a few blocks away, and he just happened to see an ad for it, and nobody knew he was in town. But he was always moving around because he he would get kicked out of places. So he was living at what's that hotel on Franklin? The, Hollywood Gardens or Franklin Gardens or something like that. But I, I have stationery with, with him with that hotel. So he might have been living there. I don't know. He was a bit of, kind of squirrely about where he lived. But And he was truly, truly pissed off. And Laurie Franks, who played um, Gloria Swanson in this uh, Swanson Sunset, I think she's here. She was here earlier. Are you here, Laurie Franks? 
Okay, well, she was here. Um, <laughs> and she's wonderful. So anyway, I don't remember what the question was. But yes, Richard was, uh, <laughs> Richard was, Richard was out and about and um, very mysterious at that point. And, you know, going to Kinko's and making copies of his script. And he had a script he was writing called Tomorrow Has Been Canceled. And it was sort of like a Terminator type of movie before Terminator. And uh, he, was, he was working every day writing scripts that were like this thick. And he didn't really know how to, how to write scripts, like the screenplay format. So they're just like pages and pages of typewritten like insanity. Um, but he was working really hard and he always thought his ship would come in tomorrow. So it was, it was very touching to hear the stories about him. Okay, we got two right next to each other. We'll go you then you. <laughs> um, well, I think she's a gay icon. I mean, uh, that movie is a classic in our community. You know, why is that? Why are we drawn to these bigger than life uh, female characters? There's something in that movie about about aging, you know, and that like holding on to things. And um, I think as as gay men, I can speak for that myself. That you know. Um, Suddenly you wake up and you're 51 years old and you wonder what happened, or you're 61, or you're 71. And I think maybe that's one of the reasons we connect with, with Norma Desmond, with Gloria Swanson, I don't know. But also she is so who she is, she doesn't care about what the world thinks of her, she just is who she is. And maybe that's one of the reasons we identify with her. But she's just so fabulous and she's got great style. And maybe that's why we love her too, I don't know. I'd love to know what people think. Why is she a gay icon? She got flair. Yeah, she got flair. Oh, her last husband, it really didn't fit into the story, but she, she was married one final time to a guy named William Dufty, and the two of them, and he was gay, and so she had at least one gay husband that we know of. So she, she, you know, she loved the gays. Um, and, uh, <laughs> William Dufty wrote a book called The Sugar Blues, and one of her crusades in the later part of her life was being in, like an anti-sugar crusader, and that sugar is poison, and she was right. And she was so ahead of her time in so many ways, she was a champion of organic food, way back in the 30s and the 40s, and they would, people would invite her to a dinner party, and she'd bring her own sandwich in her bag. <laughs> she'd ask the butler to like put the sandwich on the plate. Um, so she was very, very particular about food, uh, the environment, uh, world peace, all kinds of things, and she was very current on everything. So yeah, and she was, she was about four foot eight or four foot seven, something like that, with a very big head. Robert Osborne said she was a tiny little thing with a big head. <laughs> It sounds like you did a deep dive, or they're like, I mean, like we've been saying, like most people know her from Sunset Boulevard, but they're like glorious ones and roles that you feel like more people need to see. Uh, Airport 75. <laughs> I was waiting for the reaction to that movie. Um, well, that's the one where she plays herself. But there are some great ones. There's uh, one called Sadie Thompson, which is a silent movie, where she plays this sort of um, sexually aggressive woman who is punished for her sexuality uh, by these religious bigots. Um, and it's really interesting and timely, and I think um, that's, that's a great one to see that not a lot of people are familiar with. So if there's a lot of films. Some of those silent films are a little hard to get through, like the, uh, the Cecil B. DeMille ones, that basically they only exist so you could just see all the different outfits that she's going to wear, which is what people paid to see. I think that still happens today. I think we have time for one or two more. Yeah, back here. Theoretically, somebody could uh, stage that. Sure, yeah. I mean, if there's anyone out there who wants to do that, I think Helen Eichler would probably be very, be very happy to see it being performed again. Can you get the book at like your local Samuel French? Or uh, it's, it was never published in a book, um, but Helen, very uh, with a lot of foresight, videotaped the, the whole production, which is why we were able to have clips of it in the show. But yeah, I mean, sure, maybe one day. We have time for one more. Yeah, over here. Hi, Jeffrey. Um, did you have a letter to like your publisher for all the inspiration that you got from all these things that you did? Is that Barbara? Yes. This is Barbara, who's in the film, and uh, Barbara was uh, yes. Barbara was very good friends with Richard and was living in that same apartment complex in um, West Hollywood, and. Um, 
I just want to say something about Barbara. She, she told this, which we couldn't use in the film, this beautiful story about how she had a cat, and the cat was, was, was sadly was killed. And she was very close with the cat and very sad when the cat died. So Richard wrote her a letter from the point of view of the cat saying, you know, I don't remember exactly what it was, but you know, I, I miss you and I love when you used to pet me and you, you made me feel so safe. And it was such a beautiful, beautiful story and it kind of showed the relationship that the two of them had. And they were very different in, in age. I mean, he was probably 40, 50 years age difference between the two of you, but you, you really connected at that time. I don't remember what your question was. <laughs> I think the original question was, how did you weight all the different material to edit it all together into this beautifully flowing film? Oh, I had, we had a lot of different cuts, and my poor friends had to sit through many different versions and, and see different ways to structure the movie. You know, at first, you know, when do we reveal the Andrew Lloyd Webber? Do we reveal it right away at the beginning? Because maybe that's something people are familiar with, or do we wait and like, you know, do it as sort of a, a real gut punch, you know, in the third act? So there were many, and there was a lot of information about Gloria's career, which is fascinating, but it just didn't really belong in the film. So DVD extras, if there are such things as DVDs, when this comes out. I think a good note to close on, we, we talked a little bit about the importance of archiving information like this, and like one of the indelible images is you standing in like the room with like the kind of discarded boxes and like thankfully found the story within that material. Um, what what can people do with their own material to make sure it's preserved? Like we have the Office Legacy Project, which is for queer moving images, and that includes home movies and, and things like that, which people might think like this. Nobody wants this archive, but no, what is your philosophy on what should be archived? Yeah, no, it's so important. I mean, all of us have our own archives, and there's the one institute in uh, downtown LA, obviously uh, Outfest Legacy Project, which is more film based, but. Uh, um, Photographs, uh, home movies, all these things are so valuable, um, not just for filmmakers, but just you know, so we can have an understanding of where we've been. And there's nothing more exciting as a filmmaker than going through the archive and finding some treasure that you didn't know existed. Um, so, and you know, in, in in past years, a lot of times when LGBT people LGBT people would pass away, their families wouldn't necessarily value what they left behind and a lot of stuff just got dumped in the trash, you know? So it's so important that we protect our, our archives and donate to our archives, because um, we probably all have some amazing treasures sitting up in the attic. And it could help shed light on a story like this, which is beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing with us, Jeffrey. And thank you all. Remember to vote for the Audience Award. Those QR codes are out in the lobby, uh, IMDb apps, and